This week we're going to be continuing our international coming of age film series by watching the Russian movie Moscow Does Not Believe in Tears. Just to give a brief overview, in this episode I'm going to give a summary of what the movie was about, talk about the culture it was taking place in, what makes the movie a part of the coming of age genre, and then just give some of my thoughts and opinions on it. So without further ado, let's get into it. Moscow Does Not Believe in Tears came out in 1981, only 10 years before the Soviet Union would collapse. The story follows three young Russian women, Antonia, Katerina, and Lyudmila. Katerina is asked to house sit for her wealthy relatives while they are on vacation, and Lyudmila convinces her to throw a dinner party in order for them to meet wealthy Russian men in order to marry. At the party, Katerina meets a cameraman named Rodion, and they begin to date. Later, Rodion finds out that, number one, Katerina is pregnant, and number two, she's not the daughter of a wealthy family. He ends up leaving her and telling her to get an abortion, but it's not possible, and Katerina ends up having to give birth to her child. After this, we take a 20-year time jump to 1979, where Alexandra, who's Katerina's daughter, is a grown woman. Katerina is now the executive director of a factory. She's still friends with Antonia and Lyudmila, and the three women visit each other often. One night, Katerina is riding the train home from Antonia's house when she meets a man named Groshka, and he strikes up a conversation with her. The two hit it off and they begin dating, but Katerina doesn't tell Gosha what she does for a living because he believes that women should make more money than men do. Around this time, Rodeo gets back in touch with Katerina. He finds out about his daughter Alexandra and wants to meet her, but Katerina tells him no. One night, he shows up at Katerina's apartment while she and Gosha are having dinner, and he reveals Katerina's true job. Gosha is hurt and leaves and Katerina becomes extremely upset, and Antonia and Lyudmila come to comfort her. Antonia's husband, Nikolai, is also present, and he seeks out Gosha and convinces him to return to Katerina. The movie ends with Gosha and Katerina reuniting. Now, I can sit for hours and talk about all the little Russian superstitions and nuances in this movie, just because it's so interesting to me. But unfortunately, we don't have that time, so instead I'm just going to focus on one thing. Women's rights in the workforce during the Soviet Union era. I'm not a true expert on Russian culture, but I did have the privilege of sitting down with Dr. Melissa Chakers, who's the history department chair here at St. Joe's. She specializes in Russian history and lived over in Russia for a few years in many cities, including Moscow. She was able to give me some insight into what the work environment was like for Russian women during the Soviet era. We see that women are, um, you know, are working. Women are doing many things, but there's a glass ceiling, yeah. right? Um, whereby, say, for example, a woman might work in a hospital, but she's never going to be the director of the hospital. Mm -hmm. A woman might work at a university, but she's never going to be the president of the university. Um, because the Soviet Union was a communist country, in communism, everyone is equal. Mm -hmm. So technically, yeah. all women are equal with men. Um, and so the rhetoric of the state was always that we are all equal. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, the reality was really different. Yeah. Um, and I think, again, where you see that is in sort of top positions. So there was never, you know, anyone, there was never a top politician in the Soviet Union who was a woman. Mm -hmm. um, so they had something called the Politburo, which would be sort of their larger executive body. There was never a female in it. So taking this into account, Katerina is absolutely the exception when it comes to her job position. Like Dr. Chakras said, it was very uncommon for women to rise to the top position in any industry. This is probably why Gosha felt so threatened when he found out about Katerina's true job. Not only did she make more money than him, but she had more power and prestige than he ever would as a simple craftsman. So why does Moscow Does Not Believe in Tears, a true coming-of-age movie? Well, for one, it follows three women as they grow up, get married, and have children. Katerina, Antonia, and Lyudmila are all in their early 20s when the movie begins, and then in their 40s when the movie ends. Although most coming-of-age movies are focused around people in the younger age, it isn't a restrictive thing. You can come of age or come into your true self at any time during your life. For Katerina specifically, we are introduced to her when she was young, and then we follow her along on her journey as she becomes a mother and as she finds love. I did like this movie, but I will say it was very long and a little boring at certain times. The movie clocks in at exactly two and a half hours, and some of the scenes kind of seemed just like filler to me. Also, I wasn't really a big fan of the ending. I know it's a happy ending, which I usually like, and that usually involves some suspension of disbelief, but is the audience really supposed to believe that Gosha just still refuses to believe in women's rights? But he still goes back to Katarina in the end. Is he expecting her to quit her job? Or does he suddenly have a random change of heart? Anyway, it seemed like that was something that just wasn't addressed very well. I will say, the lighting, colors, and set design on the movie are very beautifully done. I also liked how it focused on a single mother and her daughter. 
That would have been a very uncommon and almost taboo story to tell back in the 1980s. But it went on in real life, and I think it's an important thing to focus on. Next week, we're going to be watching the Mexican movie Tigers Are Not Afraid, so stay tuned for that.